I'm going to tell you that in a second. So <laughs> let's start Digital Classroom, guys. Here we go. Okay, and we're back. Okay, today, you guys asked for it many, many times, and we finally gave in. That's the stuff. You can ask whatever you guys want, and we always try to do what you guys want to see. So, the question was, Frank, all the models that you work with, like Nadine, Ingrid, um, well, Lois. Lois, they know you, right? So, you did a test shoot with them. So, then before you put them in front of the camera, you already know the models. You know what they can do. So, what about when you have a studio and you get a model in that you never saw before? Somebody that's totally strange to you. Somebody that literally comes in, you shake her hand, and 10 minutes later you have to do the photo shoot. Well, today we have a model, and I have to look at my screen, Atalia. That's her name. And I never saw her before. And a week saw her before, and a week had a little conversation with her if she was willing to do it. So we didn't tell her anything about what we do. We told her it's a live stream. So she's totally new. So I never saw her. It's the first time I see her. Hi. She looks awesome. So how do you approach that? What do you do with your model the first time she comes into the studio? How do you set up your photo shoot to make it successful? How do you... Well, all those questions I try to answer today. Now, the first thing that's very, very important is know your shit. Very simple, know everything. So, make sure that your camera works. And, of course, today my camera will break down. You will see. It's one of those days. So, your camera has to work. You make sure that your lighting works. You make sure that you just know what you're going to do. <coughs> so, don't mess around with new stuff when you have a new model. Just try to stick to the stuff that you know that works. For the very simple reason, there's nothing more offsetting for a model than a photographer that just fools around with his kid and doesn't know what he's doing or she's doing. So you have to make sure that everything is streamlined. It has to be a well-oiled machine. Because at that po moment you don't have to worry about what your model is wearing or what your model is doing. You only can focus on your model because the styling is already taken care of, your lighting works, and at that point you can have that connection with your model. Now the approach to the model, that's something that's always a little bit tricky for people. Because how do you approach your model? What do you do? Well, what we do the first moment she comes in, she gets something to drink, and I don't introduce myself yet. I let her do to a female intern or in a week, and at that point I will just briefly come by and say, hey, I'm Frank, and I will go to the office or to the restroom or whatever, and just let her get used to that, hey, he's really tall, or he's really big, or whatever. So she will have five or six, have ten minutes, whatever, to think about like, hey, that was the photographer, so this is the guy that's going to shoot me. What do I have to prepare for? So at that point, she can literally start thinking about, for example, how, how should I do my posing? What is the lighting setup? So there, there are many variables that go through the mind of your model. So you don't want to over, overstimulate that. So just take it easy. So after 10 minutes, I will actually go to my model, sit down, and just talk to the model and just tell her stuff about our studio, what we love to do, and listen to what she likes to do. Music, of course, in the studio will be played according to the taste of the model. For the very simple reason, if you are into death metal and your model is into Christmas music, you just play some Christmas music, maybe death metal Christmas music or whatever, just try to find a balance. There are certain kinds of music that I really love, I really don't like, but if the model is really into it, no. Well, there are some things that I won't play, but there, there aren't many. So I will literally do it. And nowadays with Spotify, you, you can play whatever you want. It's important that the model feels at ease. Now, the other thing is, of course, your distance. So when you use a light meter, make sure that you use your arm extended. So don't meter like this, very close to the model. Just keep that distance and always tell her what you're going to do. So when you come up with a light meter, don't just put it in front of her face and let it go. You just very simply tell her, I'm going to meter the light, I'm going to come close. And that's it. Okay, so today we're going to use small uh, flash, so speed lights. So that gives a little bit of an extra edge for myself because speed lights is, of course, something that we do a lot, but we don't do as lot as uh, the Hensel lighting, so the big strobes. So in other words, I'm making it myself difficult. Model I'm seeing for the first time, as he looks awesome. I use speed lights, which I don't use a lot. I do use it, but not like every day. And, of course, a live stream. What can go wrong, right? 
Yeah, okay. That don't, don't just uh, ask for it. Anyway, so if you have any questions in between, just feel free to ask them in the chat room on Facebook or on YouTube, and we'll try to incorporate them into the live broadcast. And of course, answer them if we can't incorporate them into the live broadcast. Now, Johan says, 10 minutes is way too much time for a model to run away. I don't know. With me, they never run away. They sometimes always stick. It could be because we also close the doors, of course. But anyway, did you close the doors? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, setup for today. Let me show you. Let me switch to camera three for that. There we go. So, we have two speed lights and, of course, the Rogue Expo Imaging flash benders. Now, the flash benders I have to tell you a little bit about. Um, those are absolutely awesome. Um, I've been using them for years, and the cool thing is that you can literally just bend the light any way you want. <coughs> now today it's more about talking to the model and creating a cool shot, and not so about the, 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 the shaping of the light and, and what not more. So today I'm going to take it a little bit easier on the techniques. I'm just going to create some images, and we're going to try to create some cool ones of course, but I'm going to keep it really, really close to only doing the images. Another thing is somebody already asked me, how am I feeling? I'm feeling okay. This was the worst disease ever, I think. It's the flu. And we left on, when in a week? April? April 1st. April 1st we and left? We were, Are you we kidding? No, no. We, we, we left on April 2nd to Sweden. And it was awesome in Sweden. We love the Swedish. And we were doing a workshop there on April 6th. Two days before the workshop, I asked Anna Week, are people coming from far away? And she was going like, yep, four or five hours. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize. You all think that we have dream jobs, and we do. Don't get me wrong, this is a dream job. But I felt so literally so sick. I couldn't even sleep laying down. I had to sleep sitting up in the RV because otherwise my throat would just block and I would just die from coughing. <coughs> so I didn't cancel the workshop. We did say we're going to do the workshop Rocky style. So what is Rocky style? Anna Week was constantly behind me with a white towel. If I would fall down, she would throw in the white towel. And, well, okay, a little bit less than that. But I managed to do the workshop. And the plans was, were to stay in Sweden for two more extra days to get better and then have a little bit of a holiday. Now, you might wonder why didn't Frank upload so much. For the very simple reason, we decided the day after the workshop to drive home immediately. And we arrived home at about 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning. And this is the first time ever you hear my voice alive again. Because up until four days ago, I sounded like James Hetfield from Metallica in a really bad way. Like, and I couldn't do anything more. That's also why I'm drinking a lot at the moment, because my voice is still totally shut. But hey, we're all having the flu sometimes. Let's continue to our day uh, job <laughs> at the moment. Let's do our digital classroom. Are you guys ready? So let's switch over to our setup. And I will ask Anna Week to come here and take over my job. Let's do the picture in picture right away so you guys can see what we're doing. And ladies and gentlemen, does that look sharper? I think so. So Anna Week will switch over to the picture in picture in a moment. She says, don't do it yet. So we're going to do it like this. Okay. Natalia. Is that the right pronunciation? Okay. Natalia. Okay. That's easier. Okay. Please stand in front of the backdrop. Yeah. There you go. Are you nervous? You should be. It's terrifying. So that's the wrong thing to say, of course, to a model. Don't say it's terrifying. Say it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. Okay. First things first. When we look at the lighting, one of the things that I love to do is use lighting like this. So this is a strip light. It's actually a rogue flash bender. And what we did is actually use a grid in front of it. So this gives me a really nice narrow beam of light. But because I never saw it before, and she does see the monitor over there, I don't want her to see the images right away, which looks a little bit wonky, because then you run away, right? Because you're used to very good photographers. Because you're a Miss Beauty, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. So always show a little bit of interest to your model, like, hey, you're a Miss Beauty. If she is, of course. If she isn't, don't say it. Okay. Let me put this back on. And there we go. It's always a little bit tight. 
And now what you see, and this is of course a little bit played, I'm fooling around with my gear, maybe I'm dropping something, and what does that say to your model? Your model will actually now experience a photographer that doesn't know about his gear. And let's be honest, I have to make images with that gear, right? So if I don't know how the gear works or I can't get something on, it doesn't give a lot of confidence to the model. So are you feeling already a little bit more nervous when you see somebody doing that? Right, yeah? Yeah, it's like going to the dentist and he goes like, yeah, drill? What drill? Just take a hammer. Y you run away, right? So as a photographer, you have to make sure that you are in control of your lighting. Okay, so let's start with this one. Now, this one is the officially the XL Flashbender, the Frank Dorov edition. And the only difference between the Frank Dorov edition is that it actually has a soft silver inlay. So it gives a little bit more bite to the image. Okay, make sure that you only have one strobe connected, so in this case, this one. <coughs> and for setting up, there are different ways of shooting with speed lights. That's actually why today we choose speed lights. You can shoot them on manual mode. In other words, I can set up everything manual or shoot ETTL. Now, when you work with a model for the first time, don't worry about all that stuff like setting it up manually. Don't, just shoot ETTL. Just make it nice and easy for the model. So she isn't terrified with light meters in front of her face and uh, hearing stuff like F8 or F11 or F13 or whatever. Just make sure that the light is set up correctly and just make some beautiful images of a beautiful girl, right? So we're going to place this straight in front. Now what you will see on her face, you can actually see a blinking red light. That's actually approximately where my strobe will be. So I'm shooting with the Sony A7R 3 and I'm using an Odin transmitter on top from Fodix. I really highly recommend it. And I'm shooting ETTL. And the cool thing is, don't be quiet. Just tell your model, like, okay, just look straight at the lens. That's awesome. Great. Now, eyes up just a little bit. There we go. Ah, it doesn't matter. On three. One, two. There we go. Now, if you have a blinker, somebody that blinks her eyes, you just count. One, two, three. But you never shoot on three. You shoot on two. Now I told you the trick. That's bad, right? Are you ready? One. So now I do it on one. <laughs> and you do it on one, two, or three. It doesn't really matter. Now, of course, this is a little bit fake for the very simple reason. I'm also explaining stuff to you guys. So she's now extra, extra nervous. So big respect for our model. And normally, of course, you take more time to just concentrate on your model and not on you guys. So let me see. What I'm going to do now, I'm shooting on manual. Let me just add a little bit of exposure. And this is something that's terrifying for a model. What I do now is like, I'm changing stuff. Do you see that? And I'm talking to myself. Let's change a little bit in this. And the model is just going like, what the heck? What, what is he doing? What? So what you can better say is, okay, I really like the images. Going to change something on the camera very quickly. Okay, there we go, looks awesome. And there we go again. Okay, look straight into the lens, there we go. Awesome, chin up just a little bit. That's nice, can you look a little bit that way? Perfect, center your eyes, just follow my hand. There we go, great. Now this is a cool trick. I always want my models to center their eyes. Now what is centering your eyes? Very, very simple. If you look at a series called The Walking Dead, you see all these people with well, a lot of eye white and the irises on one side. That's when a model looks that way and also puts her pupils that way. So you get a lot of eye white. So what I try to do is just hold my hand here and just let her look at my hand. And at one point she will know if she works longer with me that centering her eyes actually means look straight forward. You also have models the first time where you go like, okay, look that way. Okay, now eyes straight ahead and they go like, whoops, and they are back again. It's like a yo-yo. So don't do that. Just tell your model, look that way. Okay, now eyes towards my hand. Works really well. Okay, let's skip forward very quickly, five minutes. I've relaxed my model a little bit. I've created some cool, very flat images, which I'm never going to use because look at the shadow behind her. It looks very, very bad. So I'm never going to use those images. So why did I shoot them? Very simple. You know the trick they did in the past? Shoot a model without filming the camera to loosen them up? That's what I actually did. So I've shot her now for 10 minutes, and I just loosened her up. And I'm just asking her, hey, did you have fun? Awesome, right? Yes. Always say yes. <laughs> and make a little bit of a joke. Now, uh, now I'm coming a little bit closer to her, 
placing the light more on the side. I'm going to feather the light a little bit. And of course, I'm not telling her that. <laughs> I'm just telling her like, okay, I'm going to place the light somewhere else. Okay, so now what you can do is just look down just a little bit. There we go. That's awesome. And I'm constantly telling my model she's awesome, even if she isn't, which in your case you are. But I'm always telling her, awesome. There we go. Now you see why I don't like shooting ETTL. Let me just cancel my focus. There we go. Okay, look a little bit more that way, all the way to the side. Chin down just a little bit. Oh, that's awesome. That's nice. Love it. Okay, let me change the light just a little bit. And of course, normally we speak Dutch. <laughs> Look a little bit more that way. Great. That's nice. Open up your eyes and look all the way up. Okay, center your eyes. Beautiful. Okay, now I'm, I'm not so afraid anymore that my model will not perform. She looks great. I already know what she can do. I know when she blinks. I know that that only were the first images because now she doesn't blink anymore. So we're making progress. So as soon as I'm making progress, I stop doing those boring headshots because let's be honest, one headshot is more than enough. We want to have something that's a little bit more interesting. So now is actually the first time I'm going to go a little bit more to the back and I'm asking her, can you cross your arms? Front. Uh, in front. Yeah, great. So this is one of the first poses I always do with a model because it's a really nice way of posing. Mm -hmm. And in this case, her dress doesn't help a little bit, but okay, look all the way there. Really nice. Okay, there we go. Love the light fall off. Just tilt your head a little bit more that way and look up with your eyes. There we go. Awesome. That's cool. And again, you can see that my exposures aren't 100% correct, and that's because of ETTL. So let's just turn it down just a little bit. I will explain in a second what happens. That looks awesome. Really nice. Can you tilt your body just a little bit that way? Perfect. And do the same thing with your arms. Great. And now be arrogant. Just be totally arrogant. There we go. Love it. Okay. Now maybe you're very enthusiastic. Are you going to go like, yeah, yeah, you look like an arrogant bitch. Yes. Don't. Keep that enthusiasm in control. Never tell your model she's an arrogant. You know what? Don't. You can ask her to be arrogant, but don't tell her, yeah, yeah, you really look arrogant. No, that looks great. That's a little bit more friendly. Right? Yes. <laughs> okay, just look straight up if you want. And now, because my model is at ease, because we're another 10 minutes further, I can ask her, like, okay, can you do some moves? Just show me what you can do. Okay. Just try. Nothing is wrong. Awesome. Love it. There we go. Love what the dress does here. Great. Really nice. I would like to see your other hand too, because now one hand is gone. There we go. Nice. Love it. That's cool. Great. Love your motions. There we go. Awesome. Okay, can you turn all the way around with your back towards me? And then when I say yes, turn around very violently for some motion. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Okay, move way more. I can see your hairs flowing. <laughs> Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Nice, do it again. Awesome. One, two, go. Great, and now just stretch your arms while you're doing it. Like yeah. Are you ready? One, two, go. And one more. Final one. Are you having fun? <laughs> one, two, go. That's nice. Now, what you can see that even when you never work with somebody, that motion is also not that difficult. Now, I don't know if these images will stand my test of perfectness, like are they sharp in the eyes? Do they look nice? Is she turning around nicely? Is everything frozen? It doesn't matter. She had fun. And now we just go back to the normal shots. Okay, move a little bit more towards me. Let's do a very high contrast shot. Just look all the way down. I'm going to move here gonna give you some really cool shots there we go that's awesome can you hold your hands uh, close to your uh, face uh, yeah try that's nice really nice wow love it eyes towards the light 
There we go. Wow. That's nice. Cool. Okay, are you in for something really spectacular, something awesome? Say yes. Yes, yeah, sure, of course he is. So now what I'm doing is, are you in for something really spectacular, something awesome? And it really builds the tension, but also gives the model the idea that we're working together. And between you and me, she doesn't listen, we're not working together. Of course, I'm working together with my model, but I have something in mind that I want to do. But if I say, hey, I want to use some heavy backlighting on you to make sure that we got some lens flare and then we're going to do this. For the model, that means, okay, now I have to perform. I hear all this difficult stuff going on, like a whole series that is calling out, like F numbers, shutter times, freezing motion, inverse square law, shadow fall off, uh, the relativity, string theory, whatever, evolution. And she just goes like, holy mother what's going on don't do that just very simply say hey are you looking into for something really cool just stress it down and don't make it too difficult and make sure that she thinks and in essence she does that she is a part of what's going on and she can steer it of course she can steer it because i want unique looks but in essence i already have something in my mind and i will just combine that with what the model does so it makes it really easy to communicate that way right Gives you the idea, like, hey, we're going to make something. Anyway, you had a question from online. Uh, I'll turn the microphone on. Uh, it's about metering. Do you meter in front? Do you meter small flash using one or two flashes? And uh, when you're on manual, of course, Johan says. Okay, when I'm on manual, I meter strobes exactly the same way if they're speed lights or big strobes or con continuous lighting. You hold the light meter in front of the area you want correctly lit, you fire the strobes or you meet a constant lighting, and that's your setting. If you use several strobes and they don't overlap, it's very wise to just meter them one by one. But in the end, you make the picture with all the strobes on. So make sure that in the end, you hold your meter in front of the area you want correctly lit and take that meter reading. If that means that two strobes will overlap, so be it, because that's also in the final shot. So the meter reading and the end is always with all the strobes on, because otherwise you never know what you're doing. Okay, let's take the flash bender off, and let's do something a little bit daring. And in all honesty, I haven't done this in a while, so let's hope it works. I think it will, don't worry. Take two steps forward. Very nice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to blast a lot of light, but I'm going to blast it around her. So probably at this time, it's very wise to go from ETTL to manual. And I'm still not going to use a light meter. For the very simple reason, this is a little bit like what I sometimes call my cooking class. It's very simple. I'm just going to do what I like. And when I use a meter, sometimes you won't get the results that you want because you get the perfect result. And in this case, I don't want the perfect result. I want something that's a little bit more fluent, a little bit more surreal. Okay, let's go to zoom. Let's go there to 105. Now, in case you're wondering what the heck I'm doing, every speed light, or at least every high-end speed light, has a zoom function. Now, that zoom function is very important when you shoot, for example, with your strobe on camera, because it doesn't make any sense to shoot for example, on 100 mil and have a spread like this. So when you're shooting on 100 mil, there are actually small fresnels inside your strobe that will actually narrow that light to the same viewing angle as 100 mil. And the same goes for 24. You don't want only part of your image to be lit. You want your whole image to be lit. So those fresnels move and they actually make it 24 mil. So what I'm doing now is I'm er narrowing my beam of light because I don't want my light to hit everywhere. I'm looking at my model. And I think I need to place this a little bit more this way. This is a little bit tricky to set up. So look down if you want. There we go. Now I'm trying to get the strobe in the picture just a little bit from the side. And let's just see what happens. There we go. This is a little bit too much. So let's see. Let's go to ISO 100. I'm always shooting with small strobes on ISO 200 because the recycling is a little bit faster, of course. I oh, really, really like this. Okay, look all the way there. That's nice. Absolutely awesome. Okay, I'm overexposing her face, not by accident, but as I told you, I want a really special look for this. 
And the look I want for this is actually in a moment I'm going to make this stark black and white. Like really, really harsh black and white. And with black and white it doesn't really offend the viewer if something is overblown. If you do this in color and you keep this in color, I wouldn't advise you to overblow this. Now the cool thing is because we now have a dark skinned model is that it's very, very high contrast already in her skin, already in her hairs, everything is a little bit more darker and that creates stunning, stunning images. There's only one thing, when I look at the image, I really like it, there's only one thing that I miss and that's just a little bit of light from the side. So in this case, and this is again, you talk with your model and you talk like, hey, we're going to add one more light to the side, it's going to be awesome, you're going to love this. And constantly I'm just making her aware of what we're doing and also, of course, why we're doing that. Okay, let's do this a little bit lower. Normally, you just place your strokes the other way around. So this one is set up wrongly, but that doesn't matter for now. So we'll just work with it. Okay, this is on channel two. Let's go here. And just for the sake of safety, I'm gonna change this. Okay, so what we're doing is we're actually gonna tilt the head like this. So now, it tilts backwards, you see that? But I'm actually gonna place it in the holder like this. So it can't move backward. So let's undo this. Okay, and connect it again. Any questions on Facebook, Annemiek? No. Okay, cool. Okay, let's place that in. There we go, so now it's more solid. Okay, we're going to place this from the side. And I only want a little bit of kiss of light. So this is on channel B, the other one is on channel A. We're going to place them both on manual. I'm going to aim this one just a little bit down. And we only want to have a little bit of light on the side of my model. Okay. So let's go to channel B. And in between, you always ask your model, are you having fun? Awesome, right? But don't let her talk back. And I will explain in a second why. Because if she talks back, her mouth moves. And that will give you really weird images. So when you talk to your model, don't ask her like, what did you do this weekend? Because if you have a really active model for the next 14 minutes, you're standing like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then at mark 14, you will pick up your camera and then she says, yeah, so and then Sunday night we went to and you're there for another 16 minutes. So don't ask her something which she can reply, but just go like, hey, you're looking fine, you're looking great. Are you having fun? Yes. So, but have that interaction, it's very important. Okay, look that way again, really nice. Of course, the first one is a test shot. There we go, really nice. I actually like it already. And that's because of you, everything just works. It's amazing, you are great. Great. Okay, we'll do something with your arms again, with your hands, towards your face or maybe in front, like, oh, that's nice, that's really cool. That's awesome, wow. You rock, girl. Now, there's one thing that's very important, and I'm going to make that mistake now. Does that feel comfortable? Not really, right? <laughs> a little bit awkward. And why? I don't say anything. I just shoot. I don't tell her she's doing fine. I don't tell her she's doing great. I don't tell her she sucks. I just keep my mouth shut. That's the worst thing you can do. Now, you also can do it a little bit too much, like for example, like this. Okay, just look that way. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Yes, oh man, oh, oh yeah. Oh wow, this is awesome. This is so great. Oh, I love your face. Oh my God, this is so great. Oh my, I have to call my wife to tell her how amazing these shots turn out. Oh my, this is the cover for folk. Yay. Uh, no. Tone it down just a little bit. Be enthusiastic, but not too much. Okay, so look a little bit that way. That's awesome. Okay, there we go. Love it. Chin up just a little bit. There we go. Do something with your hands again. Oh, yeah. There we go. Great. Love it. Chin just up a little bit. There we go. Great. Awesome technique. Girl, you rock. And this way you 
you don't say anything that actually has any meaning. You just go like, great, nice, awesome, awesome, great. Don't repeat awesome too many times because they won't fall for that. Different things. Um, and it's really into that mood. Don't overdo it, don't underdo it, but make sure you keep talking to your model. Okay, let's see what we shot and what we can do in Photoshop. And then you also have a second set, right? Is it as stunning as this one? Is it as stunning as this one? So. I'm sure. <laughs> so you can go change. I'm gonna show them what you can do in Photoshop with your images. Okay, turn off the strokes to save batteries, of course, and save the environment, whatever. Okay, and let's go to the computer and let's do some Photoshopping. Okay, we have a question and he tells me, okay, let's see. Okay, let's switch over to MyCam number four. There we go, and switch over here. Okay, first we'll do the questions. Um, hello from Italy. Hello, Italy. How are you? Um, you shoot in RAW. Why? Why not? Shooting in RAW is the best way to shoot. If you shoot in JPEG, everything is already set. Your color balance is set, <coughs> your exposure is set, of course, and you can't change anything later. Of course, you can change a little bit with exposure, you can add some highlights or shadows, but JPEG is an 8-bit, very, very compressed uh, file format that doesn't really fit the whole information that's inside your sensor. Like, for example, an 8-bit system is 265 steps. If you look at the 12-bit system or the 16-bit si system where you work, it's 65,536 steps, which is a huge amount more. Imagine only having to spend $250 or $65,000. That's the difference between a dinky toy car and a Tesla. So that's why we shoot RAW, because RAW rocks. And let me see, any other questions? I just want a platypot from Kelby1. Can you do a class about it, the best use of work? Um, the platypot, I can't do a class, a class about for the very simple reason. It's a very simple device and it's awesome. Don't get me wrong. You just put it underneath your camera or your strobe and you can place it on a flat subject. You don't need to bring any tripods. So on location, it's for example, great for 360 cameras, for action cameras, for the Osmo Pocket or your camera if you don't have uh, any gear with you to place it on. The platypots are absolutely awesome, but I can't do a class on it. It's like doing a class on a, on a pencil and an eraser. You draw a line, you erase it, and that's the whole class. So I can't do two hours about it, or I have to do two hours of jokes, what you can do with the platypot. And then I will probably be done in five minutes. So no class on the platypot, but it's an awesome product, really. Okay, Trevor says, I noticed that the TTL lighting was a bit inconsistent, manual better. You got it. That's why I don't like TTL. Now, what does TTL do? It's actually pretty simple to explain. TTL gives you the exposure for 18% gray, meaning if you shoot something, the camera will calculate everything in that scene to 18% gray or 12% gray, depending on the camera you use. Now, when I started shooting those front light um, portraits, it was pretty easy. We have a dark skinned model, we have a relatively light backdrop, combine them together and you create approximately 18% gray. Approximately. It's, it's never correct, but it's approximate. It, it looks nice. Let me put it that way. Now, the moment that I started shooting from the side, everything went dark, including the model, except the overexposed parts. So that means that if you add everything together, it will not be 18% gray anymore. So, it makes the dark uh, backdrop a little bit more grayish, meaning that the face actually blows out. At one point, it can't make it more gray, so you end up with a dark backdrop and a totally overblown face. And a lot of people think like, hey, but the backdrop is dark, right? So change the output of the strobe. It doesn't work that way. The reason the backdrop is dark is because there's so much dynamic range available. There isn't any more. So the backdrop will stay dark, but the camera tries to correct for that 18% gray, meaning the face will blow out completely and you end up with a totally mediocre shot or actually a shot that you can actually trash. So that's when we started doing that backlighting. I actually switched over to manual mode because with manual mode, the strobes always give out the same amount of light 
there will be a little bit of variance with speed lights, but relatively the same amount of light, minus or plus one tenth of an f-stop, and that's very controllable, because now if you walk around your model and you create higher contrast by walking around the model, actually the exposure will stay the same. If you do the same thing with ETTL, shooting lighting and camera will be okay, but as soon as you start moving here and you create more contrast, your exposure will actually go up, because more contrast in the shot means more dark, means the camera will try to correct for that. So that's why manual is very, very consistent, use a light meter and you rock, and ETTL is a little bit more flaky, and let's be honest, in 99% of the cases, ETTL will give you great results, which you can always alter in Photoshop. So, no problem. Uh, let me see, when you shoot small flash, do you also use gels? Yes, not today, maybe, maybe in the second set. I never know what I'm going to do. But normally, yes, we also use gels. Lighting is lighting. It, there, there's really no difference. I get this question a lot. Do you use this with speed lights instead of with big strobes? There is no difference. Lighting is lighting. So, if you use a loom cube, you can use gels. If you use big studio strobes, you can use gels. If you use speed lights, you can use gels. In the end, it's the lighting that you have and the result that you want to get. So if that result means blue shadows, use a blue gel. If that means no shadows, you use a ring light. And that can be continuous lighting or, for example, a strobe. There's really no difference. So just think about lighting as lighting and not about, like, can you do something with speed lights that you can't. Okay. Let's go to desktop picture in picture. There's oh, there's a question on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, did you do photo shoots with the Godox AD200? Okay, did I do photo shoots with the Godox uh, gear? No, not yet. Um, and I don't know if that ever is going to happen. Um, Godox creates some really cool stuff, but in all honesty, you can't test everything. I recently got a question from somebody about uh, Lens Baby. So I'm a really, really, really big fan of Lens Baby. I hope Lens Baby is watching. I love your kit. I don't like the older ones where you have all the little um, like dishes that you put in to get it out of focus area. But like the, I, I have, I believe it's an 80 or 85 portrait lens that also has that tilt option. I'm in love with it. I also tried the, the 40 at Professional Imaging. They have a sweet 35. They have some really cool stuff with vintage looks. I love vintage lenses. I, I have my whole cupboard filled with M42 and Leica R lenses. So I love that look. And I would literally love, this guy asked me like, can you do a video where you show the different lens babies compared to each other? And I was going like, sure, wire me the money to buy everything. Sometimes people just think that we get all this stuff for free. Now, I would love to be that true because then I would love to have the whole baby, lens baby lineup. But in essence, uh, if we don't have any relations with the company and I don't have any relations with Lens Baby, we have to pay full retail for those lenses. And of course, you can ask for review samples, but often they only give you them for one or two weeks. And one or two weeks is just way too little to really do an extensive test. And I don't want to be that guy that, well, maybe you saw it on social media, the Huawei P30 Pro, great camera was reviewed by a lot of people, announced the best camera in the world at the moment, and I agree, but there's a huge problem with their uh, ICC profiling inside. So RAW files, they have the totally wrong colors. There's not one reviewer in the world that saw this. Everybody is claiming it's the best camera, RAW looks amazing. I don't know what they tested. I don't want to be that reviewer. If I do a review, I need the product at least a month or two months. And the problem is, if you ask for 10 lenses, they won't send you those for a month. You can keep them for a week, so I don't do a review on that stuff. So, Johan, I would love to test Godox, but I won't. Because I have to buy it, and I have to work with it for a month. And in all honesty, Hensel is very good for me, and Hensel is one of our supporters. And the same thing goes for Fodox. So, at that point, there isn't really room. And I'm honest with that. They make great products, but you won't see them uh, probably with us. Although, I really like what they're doing. It's it's, let me put it this way, I want something that's very, very stable and gives you the same light output all the time and also is very fast with freezing motion. And that's something that with Photix and Hensel I know for sure, and Alan Grom of course and Profoto, and I never tested the Godox, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. I hope that, sorry for the long explanation, but I just want to be clear about that. Okay. Um, 
I have a Godox, you can borrow it if you want to test. I don't think that's why, so don't. Now, sorry. And again, I have to be loyal also to the, to the guys that really support my work. Okay, so let me see. So the portraits, they're okay, but I don't like the shadow behind. Now, why did I not ask my model to stand a little bit more forward? Why didn't I ask my model to do this or to that? Oh, let me go to switch uh, to uh, split screen. There we go. Okay. So I don't like the shadow behind her. Now, the reason I didn't ask her to go away from the backdrop is as soon as my model is scared of posing, what you will see is that models will actually move a little bit forward, a little bit more back. If I place them pretty close to the backdrop, they will feel the backdrop behind them. So they will stay in position. And at that point, all the images will turn out very nicely. And I already know that the first batch of images I can throw away because her expression isn't right yet. She doesn't feel at home right. So at that point, just shoot it to get them loose and let them feel that backdrop in the back. Because at that point, she can just move a little bit and she knows where to stay. And of course, if you are further, you can just move your model away from the backdrop, move your strokes a little bit closer, and you can get those shots anyway. Okay, so as soon as we move the strobe to the side, this is actually where I started to shoot. And you can indeed see that ETGL does change. Oh, this is an annoying bug. Okay, so you can see that ETL changes a little bit, but that's not so bad. So here you can see it a lot. So this was the setting. Now we go to a more three-quarter body, so you can actually see that ETL just gave up for the very simple reason. It, it's explainable. If you look at this, it's a lot of model. It's a little bit of backdrop. If you look at this, there's vignetting going on. There's a lot of dark, and ETL will just at that point just give up. But you can adjust as I did here. And get some pretty cool and nifty shots. Love this one. Oh, this one is cool. Okay. okay. Let's go through the images very quickly. Let me see if we got something that's nice with our turning. This one looks really cool. And again, because you're shooting ETTL, sometimes it goes wrong. But luckily, when you're shooting raw, we can adjust that. Oh, I really like this. Normally, I'm not somebody that will change this this lot, but in this case, to save the image, oh yeah, I love it. Okay. Okay, here we have the more uh, low-key shots. I really like this one. So I got a problem. I got way too many shots at the moment. Okay, these are the black and whites. They're going to be black and white. Oh, I love this one. Great. Okay, let me go very quickly if I see something that's better. No. no. This is this is cool. Okay, give it five. Okay, let's go. okay, cool. Okay, I always have it set on sword on rating. So first, second, okay, this one is better than this one. So I'll take that one out. This is the way that I always do it. I will always go through my images. The moon, this one has to have a little bit more exposure. And this is why I'm such a big advocate for using light meters, guys, because then I don't have to do this stuff. And I don't have to make sure that if I have two images in the same series, that I have to adjust that again. And that just takes time. You never get it 100% right, so no. Okay, so I have a few images left. And because this is a new model, I will just give her a little bit more than I would normally do. Okay, so let's retouch two of those to give them the look that I want. Okay, so let's do this one and this one. Okay, these two. Let's go to Photoshop. So for Photoshop, I'm using TIFF, uncompressed Adobe RGB, and then open Photoshop. So let's just process this. Control D. Okay, let's set everything up for retouching. Let's change my keyboard. And now that you see Photoshop, can people online please respond if now Photoshop is sharp? Because we got a lot of complaints from you guys that Photoshop wasn't sharp and that there was a lot of stuff that was blurry and wasn't quite easily to see. And I think we solved that problem, to be honest. Okay, so let's start with this one. Now with motion, I always keep a little bit more extra room and you can see why. Now in this case, I actually cut off her fingers. Don't tell anybody. We're gonna solve that. 
Now, there's a trick, and a lot of sports shooters use this. Don't show everything, just close in. Because if you close in, it looks like she was so close. She was so close, she was so close. You couldn't even capture her, uh, sorry guys. You couldn't even capture her in camera. And that gives you a way better look than if something is like this. Because now you have a lot of room around me. This is like a little bit better because now your attention goes to my eyes. And when you're really close, it's like, this is, this is awesome. You see the effect? Now I'm barely just fitting into that camera. I'm just trying to crawl out, maybe a little bit more horror. But at that way, you can actually use composition to make something a little bit more exciting. So if I cut off her fingers, I'm not panicking. I'm going like, nah, it was better if it was there, but solve it with a crop. So let's go with a crop and then crop very, very aggressively like this. Okay, let's see. I want negative space. And by the way, I want to make a vote to change the word negative space into positive space. And why? Because positive space, or sorry, negative space as it's called, it's a very negative name. But in essence, without negative space, your image will suffer. So I call it positive space because it just gives the, uh, gives the it just gives it more mood. Okay, let's see how our skin is. Again, this is the first ever time I'm retouching her. So I don't know how her skin is. Let's see if she needs any work. Yeah, we, we can do some stuff with this. Okay, let's go to 100%. Okay, fit on screen. Okay, let's run a filter. Now, this is every digital workshop we do this, so I'm gonna explain it very, very quickly. I'm gonna duplicate my layer, uh, run a filter called Portraiture 3, and then make a layer uh, mask. So this is done for our previous model. So the first time I'm running this, I have to do it manually for the very simple reason this is a new model with new skin tone. So go to image normal portraiture 3. Uh, let me see, pretty sharp now. Okay, cool. So I think we should tackle that. Is there a reason you prefer to use TIFF rather than PSD in Photoshop? A lot of people ask me this, <laughs> trust me. And in all honesty, it's old fashioned. When I started out with retouching, PSD wasn't as accepted as it is now, and TIFF just worked everywhere, so I just stuck with TIFF. In the end, there's not really a difference between PSD and TIFF. They're both 16 bits, you can store layers with them. It's just a personal preference. If I would have started nowadays, I think I would advise people for compatibility, still go with TIFF, but most of the, the PSD will do just fine. Though those instances where a PSD isn't red, I think you won't, no. And you can use both. No, don't worry. Okay, just go to 100% for now. I have to be honest, my Wacom is now scaling because we did try something also with the scaling on the Wacom to make it more sharp. Actually, it looks pretty good. Now, I always have it on full blast. As you can see in the top, I'm, I'm literally just blasting every detail away. Now, in the end, you will never see an image of mine that looks like a Barbie doll for the very simple reason I want detail there. I found out with image normal portraiture, if we put it on the highest setting, it blows out all the detail. It makes the skin super, super smooth. But what I do now is actually with that layer mask, I will literally use a brush and I will not use it on 100%. So it's never 100%. It's always a little bit less. So it's now black. So let's say I'm, I'm first doing the areas where I really want a lot of skin smoothing. So that's everything here. And this is about 80%. Now, if I do it again, like here, now it never adds up to 100% completely, but it gets close. And this way I have super control over where I want my skin smoothing to fit and where I don't want it. Okay? And you can also use pen pressure, of course. Now, for the skin itself, I will actually go to 100% here. Now, if you see some artifacts, it's probably because of the scaling of the walk-on, but I didn't want to change that for this digital classroom. Next digital classroom, I will put the scaling back to normal, and that would give you even better 100% views. But we changed two things, and I have to make sure that one of them is actually what did the trick. So next time, if it's blurry again, we know it was the scaling. What, Annemiek? Oh, sorry. Oh, and of course, the noise is because I used a lot of shadow uh, fill-in because ETTL, again, it underexposed, so I had to
push the file a lot, as you can see here, and I'm already shooting on a higher ISO. So, okay. Well, pretty nice. And of course, you're looking at 100% of a 40 megapixel file. So, when I do the skin, I always flatten my image for the very simple reason I know what I'm doing. I know that after the skin retouching, I don't have to do anything else. So, just flatten. Go to 100%, and now what I will do is I will literally just go over the model's face and use the spot healing brush, the new one, and I'll just very quickly just go over some of the details that I don't want to see. Now, in all honesty, a model has to stay real. So in other words, you can spend hours on this and making her look like she just came out of a Photoshop commercial, but you don't want to do that. Just leave some of those pores in. Now, if she ate the whole Hershey factory before she came to your photo shoot and she's filled with these little buggers, take them all out, but leave a few in that normally will appear on her skin because nobody walks around with perfect skin. This is also, by the way, the reason why I never retouch in front of my models because zooming in on these images can be very, very confronting for the models. It goes like, ooh. I sometimes make the joke when we tested the 100 megapixel phase one, I actually made the joke that you can see the DNA of the sheep where the clothing was made from because you can zoom into so much detail. Of course, that was a joke. But I, you get it, right? Okay, as you can see, I don't do everything. I just do a little bit. Now, some people call this sloppy retouching. And in digital classroom, it is sloppy retouching. Normally, I do it a little bit better. But I think it's not sloppy retouching. I think it's just making it a little bit more real. So I'm in between 100% super smooth retouching and just keeping it without any retouching at all. I'm just somewhere in the middle. So I do retouch, but I don't want it to be too fake. Maybe when that comes into folk again, then or in fashion, I will do it. Okay, so overall, I love the shot. I don't want to do too much to the backdrop. Normally, I use something called Topaz Studio to really make the backdrop jump. I'll show you that very quickly how it looks, and I will show you why I don't use it here. So go to Topaz Studio and go to Clarity. Okay. And Let's drop that down to this monitor. Okay. And just go to favorites. Now, the reason I'm not going to do it here is because I actually like that backdrop a little bit softer. So when I take the effect off and on, you can see that it does work great. But in this case, let me, let me just run it so you can see what it does. There's a few questions. Okay, ask. Is there a reason to prefer to use stiff rather than PSD? In I already answered that question. No, the other question is from Fred and Ineke. Okay. Do you ever use contouring or is image numbing doing this? Contouring? I don't know what you mean with contouring. Sorry. Well, she's in Italy. Maybe it's Italian. Maybe it's Italian. <laughs> Take some pizza. It has to be here in 20 minutes or I don't pay. Okay, anyway, so you can see the difference. And in all honesty, when I look at the big screen over here, it looks okay, but not a full blast. Let's go down to zero. Come on, to zero. To zero. And then go from zero to hero. I think this is more than enough. Just give it a little bit of... I love this stuff. Okay, go down, layer flatten image. Now the only thing we have to do is give it a tint, because I love tinting. <coughs> now for tinting we use Alien Skin Exposure 4, and we have a lot of presets for that. I'm going to show you very quickly a link where you can get those. So you can go to frankdorov.com slash presets for all my presets, and that's really all my presets. Uh, remind me later. Uh, and I don't like... Um, to ask money for you guys for something that I don't use. So all the presets that you see here on the left side, and those are huge, look at this. All those presets I adjusted to my own taste. And those presets are all in that pack. Every time I add some presets, I wait a year and then I upload a new pack. So if you already bought it, just email me and you will get a new pack. But overall, just get those. And the cool thing is they're only like 10 bucks. So don't spend more on preset packs, by the way. I already explained that a few times in Digital Classroom. You can really easily make them themselves. So for 10 bucks, that's great. 
don't spend a lot of money on it. It's just a shame of your money, a waste of your money, sorry. Okay, let me see if I like this. I really love this look. Gives it a little bit of a blue tint. Let me see if we have something that's better. Oh, black and white is nice. No, I think we're going to leave it with this. Yep. And then just move it down just a little bit. There we go. And in all honesty, often it's just a little bit. It's it's not too much, just a little bit. Okay. Um, I think she means dots and burn to bring out cheekbones. Ah, and then immediately she responds, like dots and burn to accentuate the features. Yeah, you can use dots and burn to accent... Ex to make features stand out more. Um, it's something that I sometimes do with a real beauty portrait, but overall I don't do it a lot, to be totally honest. I know how it works, and again with beauty portraits or when we do something that really is focused on the face and really those features, you can always use a little bit of dodge on the highlights, a little bit of burn on the, on the shadow areas. For example, when you shoot somebody without a shirt on, don't worry, uh, when you shoot somebody without a shirt on and you want those muscles to really stand out, what I normally will do is just add a little bit of shadow detail, uh, sorry, lower the shadow detail on the shadow areas with burn and then just open up the highlights a little bit with dodge. And that way you make that contrast a little bit higher and those muscles really, really show up. And when I do it with myself, there won't be any muscle. Sorry. Okay, so I like this. File close. Okay, now the other one. That's more taste. So this one, uh, let me do the same thing because now I can do portrait smooth in an action. Okay, take a white brush and I will do this really fast for you guys because you want to see more of course. So I'm not going to, I'm going to retouch this again for the model later on. But for now I'm just going to do it fast. Oops. Um, okay, there we go. A little bit too enthusiastic. Okay. Awesome. Okay, same thing here. Layer flat an image. Just use the new healing brush. Now there's also another healing brush where you have to use old to sample. That's the one I use when I have to do a lot of work that isn't related to dust or pores. And then I'm a little bit more um, uh, precise. This is a little bit like Photoshop determines where it comes from and sometimes I have to do it over, like just a minute ago. But overall, the new healing brush is really nice. Not comparable to the one two years ago, which was horrendous. But this one really works well. It, it's like content aware feel, it gets better every update. And sometimes they break something. Okay. Let me see the top. Okay, it looks fine. Okay, so this one I wanted black and white. Now for black and white, I want to do something else. I want to create a little bit of focus effect. So let's go to Alien Skin Exposure. And the cool thing is you can do this in Photoshop. Photoshop also has filters like tilt and shift lenses or filters like... Um, uh, selective focus or whatever. Uh, you can use lens baby uh, lenses. But overall in Alien Skin Exposure, because I have a dark backdrop, this is why we shot it against dark, I can use the filter effects inside Alien Skin Exposure. Now why shouldn't I advise to use those filters all the time? For the very simple reason, if the backdrop shows up and you use for example tilt and shift lens focus effect and the backdrop shows up, it looks really really fake. You have this line of sharpness, the backdrop is sharp, the model is sharp, it just doesn't look right. So make sure that you don't do that. So, but as soon as it's like this, uh, you're fine because you don't see the backdrop. Okay, let's first go for that black and white look. So I'm gonna go black and white. I'm gonna have a really stark black and white. So almost like there's no detail. Ooh, I love this one. Let's see if we can tone it down just a little bit. Now this is the cool thing about my presets. I have presets that are very, very similar to each other. And with just small changes. There we go. This one I really like. Okay, do we want noise? I think so. Now for noise, I always zoom in 100%. And it's actually grain, it's not noise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for noise. 
and green, and just go up. And you can see it changing in the backdrop. And normally I will pull down on the shadows, so I don't want a lot of grain on the shadows, but I want a lot of grain on the highlights. And I think this is one of the tricks which create beautiful black and white shots. Because normally when it's from a camera, you will see that the, the shadows will, will really be noisy because it's a shadow, right? But if you pull the shadows down and keep them really clean, and you just bump it up in the midtones and highlights, you get this really nice black and white, a really organic look, which I really like. Okay, there we go. Okay, go to fit. There's one thing that could work here, so let's try that out. And you didn't see me doing that again uh, before. So let's go to IR, ER, that's actually infrared. And let's do color contrast. Let me just see what happens. It gives me just a little bit of a glow on her face, as you can see. So when I turn it off and on, you can see that it just glows a little bit. So I really like that effect. You can do fog. This is too much. But also because I want to change that focus a little bit. I really like this one. There we go. Okay, turn it on and off. See? Just creates it a little bit more nicer. And then just go for bouquet. Bouquet. Let's do this. And we'll make our bouquelicious. So go here. Take that one out. Uh, remove that one. There we go. Okay, just place it on our eyes. And just move this. Come on. Okay, there we go. And just first do this. Full blast. Now I see what I'm doing. Okay, I want that iron to be sharp. There we go. And then just pull it down and hardly use anything. Don't do it a lot. Just like this. A lot of people do like this. Yeah, now I can see it's out of focus and I see those. It will never be out of focus like this. If you ever shot with a tilt and shift lens, it will never be out of focus like this. Unless you're doing something wrong or you're shooting on a full-size medium format 6x7 on 2.8, then it will be like this. Normally, I think the maximum will be around this and we don't want maximum. We just want a hinge of the effect in. So go to zero and just build it up. There we go. Really like it. So when I turn it off, you hardly see any difference, but it just gives you a little bit of extra there we go, really like it. Maybe even four. Let's go to four. Yep, cool. And press apply. Okay, so now we went from color to black and white. And because we did a lot, it takes a little bit of the rendering. Okay, there we go, really like this. Okay, flatten an image. Okay, looks cool. File close. Yes. Okay, and let's go back to Capture One. Okay, we're going to set up for the next set. I'm going to first see if there are any questions in between. Let me just switch over. Anyway, do we have any questions on Facebook? Uh, well, somebody asked if you have to use score logs. But I Again. Replied. Okay. Yeah, Guys, well. stop asking for Godox. Three times is more than enough. Uh, let me see. Luminar has a very good dodge and edge uh, and burn function. Uh, okay, Luminar. I love Luminar. Let me put it forward. I love Luminar. I've converted, I think, a million people to Luminar. Okay, maybe a little bit less, but a lot of people to Luminar. I still love Luminar. They're great guys, they're awesome. The only problem is I'm using Luminar as a plugin and somehow a year ago they broke something and now every time I do a preview in Windows, so I do a preview, I go to Photoshop and it's totally different. I have to adjust the gamma curve or in other words curves and at that point it works. So there's a color space difference. And I've told them that many, many times, they promised me to solve it many, many times and up until today, I have to test Luminar 3.1, so we'll do that very soon. But up until today, what I see on my screen, and in the past it worked. So what you see on your screen, you make these fine adjustments. You press apply, and you want exactly that same thing, like Alien Skin Exposure and any other plugin. You want exactly that same thing to appear on your screen, right? You don't want that red immediately turns into orange or whatever, or you have more shadow detail. You don't want that. You want it exactly the same. 
So until they fix that, I can't promote Luminar. I'm very strict with that. You guys can only spend your money once. And if you want proper working software at this point, download the trial version and see if it in, on your machine it works. I believe on Mac it works flawlessly. On the PC, the preview doesn't fit what comes into Photoshop. If you use the standalone, no problem at all. Great software. On the standalone, it doesn't matter because you're exporting and converting. But when you go into Photoshop, it just doesn't work. I hope they fix it very soon because Luminar absolutely rocks. It's an amazing software package. But they really have to fix that. Um, why are you healing and cloning on the background layer instead of a copy or empty layer? It, it depends. Um, it, it's a very good question. If you have a laptop that's low on memory or that only has 8 gigs, it's very nice to do an empty layer and then sample all layers and just clone on that layer. Um, in this case, I have more than enough speed. I know, again, I know what I'm doing. It sounds arrogant. I don't mean it as arrogant. But I know what I'm doing. I've done this before. So I don't use extra layers for protection. I don't do that. That sounds weird. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? So we don't use extra layers because I can go back. I just do it on the background layer. It's speed and it's just easy. Now, if you have a laptop again and you're, you're in doubt, and sometimes when I do compositing, I use that a lot. I just use an empty layer. I clone and heal on that one. And then it just saves you a lot of hassle because your file doesn't get twice as big. So good question. And let me see, no more questions. Okay, um, we're going to set up for the next set. And in between, I want to show you something. Now, you all know I love Kelby One, right? They're, without any doubt, my favorite platform online. And we recently did two new videos for them. I want to show you the clips of what we did. And I'm sure when you see the videos, you're absolutely going to love it. Because they're absolutely cool. They're totally frank, as Scott said. So, there we go. Hey guys, welcome in the Netherlands. My name is Frank Dorof. I'm a Dutch photographer and we're in front of our studio. Now we all know about shooting portraits, right? Or shooting fashion. In our class on Kelby One, we're actually gonna do one step further. How to add a little bit of motion to really spice up that shot. How to use water effects. How to use gels, how to use lens flares. Those are absolutely amazing but also how to retouch those shots in a really quick workflow. But most of all, it's gonna be about lighting. It's gonna be about coaching that model. So why should you watch this class? Well, for the very simple reason. There are so many photographers out there. There are so many images out there. And you want your images to show up on top, of course, because they're more interesting, they're more evolving, they're more storytelling. There's so much you can do that is actually pretty simple instead of just putting a model in front of the camera. Just change a few things over with lighting or coaching or motion and you can really make a huge difference without doing anything else than just watching this class. We just jam-packed this class full of information about shooting portraits and it's only on Kelby One. You're gonna love it. Hey guys, my name is Frank Dorof and we're in front of our studio in Emmeloord and it's freezing cold. So it's the perfect day, uh, not really, to shoot on any location. Because let's be honest, you don't have to travel far to create stunning images with your models. You can do it anywhere. So today we're going to go out in the field, we're going to go to a bicycle tunnel, we're going to use a long road with strong backlighting and we're even going to be pulled over by the police. Yeah, that was interesting. Now you might wonder, why should I follow this class? Well. We're going to start from the bottom. We're not going to use a lot of strokes. I'm not going to use difficult techniques. You do need powerful strokes for this, but if you have a powerful stroke, you can do this very, very easily. We keep it simple, but most of all, we try to create images with a lot of impact that will make you stand out from the rest. So join me on kelby1.com for my new class shooting on any location. You're going to love it. Okay, now that thing about the police, that was absolutely true. That was horrendous. Now, the story is, if you don't see the, um, yeah, if you don't want to see the whole video, what actually happened was we are shooting inside a bicycle tunnel. Bicycle tunnel, right? <laughs> of all locations. It's actually a pretty cool way to shoot. And it was freezing cold. And in the studio, Lois, our model, was wearing nothing on her leg. So she had nude leg. Uh, Nude legs? 
whatever. So she had a long dress on, of course, but nude legs and um, uh, shoes. And I already told her, like, hey, it's below freezing outside. It's really, really cold. Those Floridians, the film crew from Kelby, they actually bought coats, especially for the Netherlands, because they don't know what cold is in Florida. Hey, come on. And um, so I actually told my mother, Lois, like, okay, wear something like, uh, maybe something like to cover up your legs too. So we actually changed the outfit to have something with a legging and clothes. She had three layers of clothing on. I had like six or seven. <laughs> and we were outside shooting in this bicycle tunnel. And Lois is, I believe, 22, 23. She looks mature. And I was done with filming. We walked back. And at that point, I saw from the corner of my eye, I saw on the other side red and blue lights. I was going like, huh? But the film crew was still packing everything up. And then behind my back, a police car without sirens, blue and uh, red, just going sideways. And they just close up that tunnel. And I was just going like, oh, my God, those guys from Kelby are still there. Let me help them. So I walked up, some police guy like, hey, stop, you can't go there. I said, but that's my film crew. And he said, oh, you're the photographer. I said, yes. He said, oh, we got this call that there was a film crew of four nasty men shooting a nude model in a bicycle tunnel. And I just looked at him and going like, what? Now, those four nasty men, well, maybe, nah, just kidding. But a nude model, underaged, underaged. That, that was the thing. She was underaged. And I was just going like, huh? And he said, where's the model? I said, she's in the car. And that's the shot you actually see in the Kelby One trailer where I'm talking to the police. <laughs> I couldn't get to my car. They stopped me like, don't go to your car. I want to talk to your model. And of course, the model had exactly the same story that I did. We're filming an instructional video for Kelby One, an American website. And they follow my work and we do an instructional video. And at that point, they wanted to see the images, of course. So I showed them the images. So there was nothing wrong. Now, let me make one thing clear. I'm not angry at the police. I love them because for the very simple reason, they got a call in and they were there within two or three minutes. That's great. The guy who called it in, if you were listening, but I probably don't think so, you suck. Because first of all, you didn't know my mother was underage for the very simple reason she's 22, 23 and she can prove it and she looks mature. So, yeah. So sometimes things happen on location that you don't account for, but they make great war stories. I actually told the police that the next set would be at the Velle Vaart, which is very close by. I said, don't come there, right? It's, it's legal what I do. No, 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 we won't come. Don't worry. You know what they did. Emmeloord is a small town and we all know each other. As soon as we were set up, two police cars came by, opened up the windows, said, hey, Frank, and they just drove off. Great, guys. But don't call in when you don't know for sure. Okay, let me see. I think my audio is clipping a little bit, so let's just turn it down just a little bit. There we go. I think this is better for audio, guys. Probably, yes. Okay. Uh, can I only see those two videos without having a whole license for Kelby One? No. Kelby One is really, really affordable. Just go there. You have to watch the videos, man. Come and on, dude. Trial. And they have a trial. So go out. Go and email us, because then we have a nice code for you for Kelby One. So if you want to... Do we have discount codes? I think so, but I have to look Maybe. into it. Maybe we have yeah. discount codes. So just email me when you want a Kelby One subscription, and you should... You know what? You actually should get two, three, four, because you get so much information, and the amount of money they charge is so cheap that you... you are you with a family? Just get a subscription for every part. And if they don't watch, don't worry, you support a good cause. I'm just kidding, but it's really true. Okay, let me see. We have something else going in, and that's actually what I love. Now, what color do I love? I love the color red, and let's see what our model brought in. This is freaking awesome. Okay, let's switch over to our cameras for uh, this. Okay, I have to do something, guys. One moment. We have a monitor that's sometimes a little bit wonky. And Anaweek, of course, has to make sure that she sees everything. And somehow there's a sleep timer on this monitor, which I don't get, because there's no need for one. Okay, there we go. Okay, and week, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Are you ready, Natalia? Yeah. Okay, cool. I have to act like I really don't know your name and we never saw each other before. <laughs> we grew up together, right, in the ghetto. 
Yeah, the Emma Lords are ghetto. <laughs> it's terrible. All the drug dealers. And... No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so now we're going to place you a little bit further away from the backdrop. So you can stand here. And I just love your coat. I just love red. Okay, color. Now, because we already worked together for at least two hours, because this is the second set, and after the second set, it always goes faster. <clears throat> now we know each other a little bit more, so now you can do a little bit more jokes. And of course, now is also the time to start doing the light meter stuff. Oh, yes. Because now we can actually set everything up on manual, because now my model knows me, she knows what I'm doing, she trusts me. Do you trust me? <laughs> That's so dumb. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so we have this remote control. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, let's <laughs> grab the light meter. Okay, now lighting-wise, I think I like it like this. So I want to make sure that she hits the light from the side. There we go. I just want a little bit of the coat on, so I'm going to do it like this. Okay, so... Don't be afraid. We are trained professionals. Okay, cool. Okay, setting-wise, let's just add a little bit more power to our B channel. Because I want a little bit more depth of field for this. Okay. There we go. Let's change this back. Now you see I'm playing around with my gear and I'm not telling my model what I do. So make sure that everything works before you do that stuff, right? Right, right. There we go. 16.5. Okay, 16.5 is a little bit too much. Let's go down. Okay, one eighth. 11.3. Okay, that's cool. Okay, 11.3, let's go down one third, so I'm now at F11. Sorry, Hans. One of my students always says I'm shooting on F11. In this case, he's right. Okay. Okay, can you look down? Uh, yeah, that way, and then just look down. Very, very nice. Okay, first things first, of course, we have to take this one out. I'm going to explain in a moment why it's there. And I'm going to start out with a very, very simple lighting setup and also a very simple shot. So I just want a very, very dark look. As you can see here, we're only highlighting the face of the model. We're only highlighting just a very, very small part. And as you can see, it's really dark. Now, what a lot of people will tell you, if you have a dark skin model, Overexposed by half a stop. Don't. Don't overexpose by half a stop. Very simple. If a model has a dark skin, you don't want that dark skin to be lighter. Right? You want the dark skin to be dark because that's what makes that model cool. Right? So if I overexpose this by half a stop, I will actually make a Caucasian, which I don't want. And anyway, where are you pointing at? You have to look at that camera. I'm looking at that camera. Okay. Yeah? So, I'm looking at that camera, that one. Cool. So, if I need a little bit more light in this case, and that's always the case when you shoot darker setups with high contrast, now I have to add a little bit of a counter light. Now, of course, you can add a little bit of a counter light by just doing it, by using an open strobe or maybe a reflector or putting something on the backdrop, but it's way more interesting to add a little bit of a gel to it because people ask me for gels. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to light the backdrop. But I'm going to do it very, very subtle. So I'm going to aim this. I'm going to turn it on. Helps enormously. I'm just going to try to put it behind the model. Now, normally, can I focus on that camera, Anouik? That works a little bit better. Yeah? Okay. So, normally, what I will do is the backdrop will be very, very low on output. So, let me see what happens. Okay, can you look that way again? Perfect. Okay, this is a little bit too little. And this is the cool thing about manual. I can just, from the remote control, change the output. 
and there we go. Okay, so now I have separation between my model and the backdrop. So it's a really, really dark shot, but I like that moodiness. And because I'm using that zoom effect, you can see that in the backdrop that red really just shines down. Let me just add a little bit more power on the backdrop so you can see it even better. Nice. Okay, so as you can see now in the backdrop, and this is way too much, it's really like a line of light. Now what we're going to do is on the backdrop I'm going to zoom. So I'm going to zoom from 105 to 24. Now look at the difference. Look that way again. Really nice. So now what you can see is that that beam of light <coughs> just moves a little bit different over the backdrop. It's not really clear, but it's, it's just slightly different. Okay. Go back to 105. There we go. And just lower the volume. Okay, really nice. And now, because I'm now knowing my model, we already worked together for a whole day, now I can actually take a little bit more time setting up my lighting and just making my model feel at ease. Okay, so really dark setup, not what I want. Now, of course, I could change my strip light from the front to something that's a little bit more flat, but at that point, I also, I actually destroy that look that I really like. So why not just use that backlighting and just turn it around towards our model? And this is why we love boom arms. Now, boom arms make it possible to not put the stand in the frame, but actually only the speed light. So I'm gonna add it to our model. And today I'm gonna keep it at two strobes. You can, of course, use a third strobe on the back. In this case, we're not going to do it. So I'm going to use it the conventional way, just lighting my model as a side light, giving it a little bit of a kicker, an accent light. Look that way again. Perfect. Now, if I would be a judge, you won Miss Beauty. <laughs> there we go. So I really like this. Gives it a little bit of an... Uh, I don't know what. I just like it. Sometimes I'm looking for words and... It's just too beautiful. Words can't describe it. You know, right? It's amazing. Okay. Just do this a little bit higher. There we go. And as you can see, as, a, as an accent light, it actually works. It gives it a little bit more, well, tension. But, let's just change the accent light just a little bit. So I'm going to go lower. See, by the way, if I'm doing right, yes. Okay, look that way again. Later on we're going to do some more cool stuff, don't worry. There we go. So this is maybe a little bit too soft, yes. You, you remember that cooking, I'm now actually adding a little bit more pepper, a little bit more salt. I'm just looking for the way that I like it. And I love this. This is really cool. Okay. Now the backdrop, of course, can give a little bit more power by adding an extra strobe. But again, today we're just going to keep it at two strobes. So I have to make it more interesting. Okay, can you turn around and then as soon as I say yes, open your coat and just turn around very violently and just throw the coat around and don't hit the strobes. Okay. Just make it like you saw the Matrix. No. Okay, you're Keanu Reeves now. <laughs> you just turn around with your coat and you do like Batman or Superman, like it's a cape. Okay. Yeah, you know Batman? Yeah. Oh. It's like the main thing here. If you don't know Batman, you're fired. That way. That way. And then focus on that light source. Yes. And then focus on that light source. Are you ready? Let me just turn it up just a little bit, just to be sure. Okay. One, two, go. Nice. Do it again. A little bit more power. One, two, go. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Damn, girl. <laughs> You look like a new, what's that name of that girl that did America's Next Top Model? Tyra Banks. Tyra Banks. You look like Tyra freaking Banks. <laughs> awesome, man. Whew. That's great. Now what can I do to improve this? Let's make it really like superhero-like. I'm going to make this a little bit more further forward. So what I'm now doing is I'm feathering this light away from the model. So it will be an excellent light, but by moving it forward, I can actually use more power on the strobe to give it also that lens flare effect that I love and I know a lot of you guys love. And it's something that's, it looks simple, it's actually pretty hard to, to master correctly, 
but just keep trying. Okay, on full power now. Let's side light. Let me see what happens. Are you ready? Okay, let me just do it like this. Okay. One, two, go. Nice. Yep. There we go. I love how it just captures the bottom part. Okay, let me just try a little bit more to capture from the lens flare. Are you ready? One, two, go. Okay, that's too dark on that side. Okay, let me just change this a little bit more downwards. So you have to make sure that this angle hits your light straight, or sorry, your camera straight on. So let's just do that now. And maybe just give her even more light. So moving the light further back. So by moving the light back, you're giving more light on your model. By moving the light forward, you take away that light. So what you can see also is now, because she's moving, she gets a little bit too dark. You see that? So that's why I'm actually making the decision now. It's an ex executive decision to take off the strip. And this way, I give her a little bit more well, space to work with, because now I have a little bit more lighting. Now, because I have a little bit more lighting, I can do another trick. I can actually aim it a little bit more towards the back. And maybe also hit the backlight with a little bit more light. Okay, I'm going to aim it up. There we go. Now, because it's a live broadcast, I'm not going to re-meter. Of course, you shoot. I'm just going to wing it, which you never should do. But okay. Okay, are you ready? Okay. One, two, go. Nice. Okay. I'm going to give a little bit more light here. Yeah, but we need more light on our face. And I'm actually going to do it by opening up the aperture. Because by opening up the aperture, that backlight is already on full power. So I can't get more power out of that. But I want more power out of that. So by opening up my aperture and leaving that one it is, that one will get brighter. But that one will also get brighter. So give me a little bit more playroom. Are you ready? One, two, go. There we go. So now you can see that the backdrop is actually starting to play. I think we have a little bit too much light on the model. And this is again, this is something that you don't do at, at the start. Because it takes a little bit of time to get right. And when you do this when your model just appears in the studio, it can be very, very discouraging because, no, it's not right, let's do it again. No, it's not right, let's do it again. And the model will actually think that it's her fault. And it's absolutely not. It's just that we're looking for that right look. Okay, let me change the ISO to 200. And as you can see, I'm now totally light meter free. I'm not using it. One, two, go. There we go. A little bit more power. One, two, go. Awesome. More power. <laughs> One, two, go. There we go. Look at that fierceness. Okay, one more. Don't worry, you're doing fine. I'm just going for perfection. One, two, go. That's it. That's perfection. That's the one. Awesome. I would like to thank you so very much for being here today and being my model. <laughs> you rock. Thank you. You're awesome. Thank you. Too. Let's work more together in the future. <laughs> we'll call you. Don't call us. No, no. <laughs> call us. Okay, let's go back to the computer. Let's say hi to our model. Bye. Bye to our model. And I have to do one thing again, but I have to do this after the model is gone, of course. And let's actually shoot the color checker passport. Because for the very simple reason, we need proper color balance because he has something red. And in the first set, we didn't do it. So let's do it now. So I'm going to ask my lovely assistant, Anna Week. Oh. <laughs> she didn't see that one coming. If you would be so kind to hold the color checker in front of your face, as flat as possible. I'm not going to make a funny face. You are going to make a no, funny face. No, you I have to. I already have a funny face. You already have a funny face. Oh, my. Okay. Let 
Let me connect the camera. You shut it down. Yeah. And I pulled the cable, so I'm afraid that the cable got loose. Now uh, let's just try if it works. Maybe I saw it wrong. Oh yeah, it worked. <laughs> My fault. Okay. Okay, let's go to the computer and let's show you guys what you can do. That is a funny face. There was a question about the color checker. Ah. Oh, can you give me the color checker, please? I want to show them what's new. Okay, let me just change back to... Uh, you didn't do picture in picture on it during the photo shoot? Nope. Okay, guys, so sorry. And we forgot to do picture in picture, so you didn't see the images coming in. I did, but not from the last one. Oh, not from the last one. Oh, oh. thank you. That's awesome. Okay, let's go back to my camera. Okay, that's great then. Okay, so let me see first whether there are any questions. A question about the color checker. Uh, what if you let the model look the other way, not into the light, but looking down? You, you can do that, try it out. I always like to have, when I turn, I like to have my model looking into the light because for the very simple reason, at that point all the attention is going to her face. Um, are you not using the color checker to make sure you get the reds just right or are you going by personal taste on this shot? Nope, color checker. <coughs> That's the Beyonce look. Yeah, could be. Okay, so why the color checker? Well, very, very simple. If you look at how color works, there are fixed coordinates for red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow, and whatnot more. And those fixed coordinates are, of course, in a table. We call them the lab table. Now, if you shoot something and you want to make sure that the reds look the way that red is supposed to look, you have to calibrate that sensor or that camera. So that's why you use a color checker. Now, when you look at the color checker, you see that underneath, this is the part that's being used, there are a lot of squares. And every square has a coordinate, 3D coordinates. So you have X, Y, Y. So X is for saturation, I is for U, and then the big Y is actually for luminance. Now, those three coordinates are fixed in a table. So when I shoot this color checker, the computer knows, hey, this red is not correct. And it will create a profile in which it tells you, for example, plus one or minus one or plus ten, or whatever, for all those three coordinates. We call those an ICC profiles, or in the case of Adobe, we call it DCP profiling. Now, in Capture One, you can now use the color checker. I will make a video on that soon. It's very, very simple. I'm not going to do it now, but you can do it very simply. And this is actually one of the most important things in your kit. You have to calibrate your monitor and you have to use a color checker passport. Now, even if you don't like using a color checker passport because you want to change the colors, trust me, if you shoot it with a color checker passport or any other color checker, or you can use the color checker SG if you want to do it really weird or big, uh, you can use the checker passport or the classic. It doesn't matter as, so as long as you have something that has all these colors and software, of course, that can interpret that into a profile because you don't want to do it manually. The reason is very, very simple. If you want to change the colors afterwards, it's important that your white balance is correct and your color space is correct, or in other words, your profiling. Because now if I create a profile, that profile will look the same in every single lighting setup, in every single outside, inside, tungsten, LED, it doesn't matter. As long as I make color balance, white balance, and I have that profile loaded. And now, I can use my preset on every single set and it looks exactly the same. So for example, me, I will never use an image that's straight out of the camera without any tinting. I will always tint my image. By using a color checker passport, I know that my band lab, or sorry, my band look, or my Chinese horror, you, you saw the presets, that they always look exactly the same under what condition I am. Now this is a special color checker. This is a new one. They just released it and it's absolutely cool because there's something on there that I wanted on there for years and they finally did it. And that's, boys and girls, 18% gray, yay! Why is 18% so gray so important? It's how we calibrate our light meters. 18% gray is incredibly important to have on something like a color checker and they finally have it. So this is the color checker 2. It's been released, I think a week ago get one. And remember, if you have a color checker that's older than two years, you have to replace it anyway, because there are, well, I believe they can last up to three years, and if you leave them in the sun, three minutes. No, I'm just kidding, probably like three months. But color checker passport two, now with 18% gray. Feels like a commercial. Hmm. Okay, anyway, the shots. 
first of all, let's get that color balance right. So Anna Week is holding the color checker. She's really enjoying it, as you can see, because I'm going to switch to picture in picture. You see that she loves the color checker. It's in her expression. She's just over the moon with it. She loves it. <laughs> so do pick white balance. And in Lightroom, it is exactly the same. Pick white balance and just go for this square. Okay. So, and as you can see, I already have everything loaded. So with me, it doesn't really make a difference. And I already have a profile. Now I'm going to show you the difference in profiling. And this is going to be very interesting for you guys if you never saw this before. So this is the color checker passport. Correct. Right? So. Now look at all the colors. Now what if I change this to generic? It's okay. So this is the built-in with Capture One. So that means that Capture One is actually pretty good with their color balance. Oh, sorry, with their profiling. And that's true. Capture One is awesome. Let's go for Sony A9 or this. You see that every time I change the profile, there's a little bit of change. But this is only within Sony. So let's, for example, go for Adobe and go for what some people do, for example, DNG files, DNG workspace or neutral. You see that all the colors are gone. You can also go for file system and go for, for example, neutral. It just doesn't look right. So this is why in every software you should find the camera that you use. For example, in this case, the A7R 3M. And as you can see, Capture One does a pretty good job. Now remember how this looks. And I'm going to go to the custom profile. Uh, if I can find it. Other. And I have to find my own. There we go. And this is my very, very flat custom profile. And this is a linear and this is an SG. So this is the color checker passport and this is the SG. Now the SG is a, pass, uh, a color checker that has more squares and is a little bit more uh, fine tunable <coughs> by software. So you don't have to do anything. You just shoot the SG and you create a profile. But as you can see, there's a little bit of difference between the two. And that's mostly in the blacks. So in the gamma curve. So this is something you can correct. But now look at what it does when you do it wrong. And this is something that I will explain in the video uh, when I make it. So we, we're just going to go for this one. And by the way, this is, for example, the profile for my P30 Pro. So as you can see, this is the correct version for the P30 Pro. You see how off those colors are compared to this? And that's the cool thing. You never have to worry again about, is my color correct? Is my smartphone giving me the correct colors? You just use one of those color checkers, and it's just awesome. But I don't want to talk too much about it. Okay, this shot, this is the one. We don't need more. This is just the one. This is just awesome. So let's go into Photoshop. And the cool thing is, why don't I do more shots um, with this setup? You have to remember that if somebody sees a great shot, they will remember that great shot. If she sees a mediocre shot and a great shot, they will always remember the mediocre shot. So when it's all this close and all combined like with the red coat, maybe I will do one with the red coat only. I don't know yet. But this one is the one I will do for the motion because this one is the best. And sometimes the model will go like, hey, can I get more images? No, this is it. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Okay, first of all, I'm going to make a really aggressive crop here. And it's not because of the backdrop, because I'm actually going to keep it very close to this. There we go. Okay. Let me just go a little bit here. There we go. You can keep aspect ratio, but I, I never do that. Okay, so now I have the problem that my backdrop is in the frame. Okay, well, that can be a problem. But with Photoshop, you can actually solve this pretty easily by just selecting it and just pressing delete. And what I'm now using is content to have fill on the big parts, on the large areas. So we're going to do a fill. In between, if you have any questions, because this sometimes can take a little while. Anavika, are there any questions on Facebook? No. Nope. OK. Kay. Now you see that close to her face, I didn't do anything yet. Because I always do first the big parts, and then I'm actually going to zoom in for the smaller parts. Okay. 
And I'm trying to do it with content that I fill as much as possible. Here it's going wrong, but that's okay. Okay, cool. This is about what I can do. Okay, now I take a bra uh, sorry, a clone tool, and I'm going to first do it at 100%. And just make sure it's soft. Sorry, guys. There we go. And remember, you know it wasn't there. I know it wasn't there. Somebody that just looks at the picture and never know that we retouched this. Unless, of course, you mess up. Very, very bad. Okay. Oh, <laughs> like that. Okay, now we see that we have a little bit of a crossover there that doesn't look right. And this is where I actually start lowering my opacity a lot. Let's say 46%. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to massage this away. Now lower it even more and do the same thing. There we go. Okay, now I want some more structure in there, and this is where we're going to use the healing brush. So I'm just going to sample some from here and just bring back detail here because sometimes when you retouch, you can take away those nice little structures. And by using the clone tool like this, you just bring it back. And because the clone tool, oh, sorry, by using the um, the healing brush because the clone tool actually doesn't take into account differences in luminance and the healing brush does so that way with the healing brush you have way more flexibility for that uh, let me see somebody asked me what if you don't have the portraiture plugin what should you use um, a very very good one is topaz clean tree it's only like 30 bucks or 35 bucks it does almost the same as image normal portraiture but you can't run it in batch, so you have to do it over and over manually. So if you don't retouch a lot of images, image normal portraiture is a little bit expensive, so go for Topaz Clean 3. If you do a lot of images like we do, make sure you get Portraits for 3. You will love it. Okay, so fit on screen, let's do the Portrait Smooth. And in a moment I'm also going to do your... Uh, I got two images in for Critique, so I'm also going to do those, so stay with me. I'm going to do this one a little bit faster. And again, when the model is gone, I will retouch them nicely for the model again. But for Digital Classroom, I'm going to rush it a little bit now. Okay. We have some stripes here, but that's no problem. I'm going to take those out. It's like I'm better than makeup. This is also where a lot of people struggle with. Like, what should I take out? I take out everything that I don't like in a shot when it's like a model shot. When I'm shooting the person as a character, I will literally ask, do you want me to keep these in or do you want me to leave scars in or whatever? Because it's part of who they are. But in this case, I'm not shooting for the model. I'm not shooting for a Miss Beauty competition. So I can retouch whatever I want. If I want her to be smaller or bigger, I can change that. If I want scars to be gone, I can change that. I'm totally free now because my model is now here for a model shoot and not for a character shoot or a portrait. Because if you shoot for an, um, an agency, then you can't take stuff out that's there because then somebody will hire your model and let's say she has a scar on her face and you take it out and she is hired by somebody that does 600 uh, headshots. You go like, oh my, that's not good. Okay. Um, Oh, by the way, if you want to have Topaz, uh, go to our website um, and go to the page called Discounts. We have a lot of discounts there for you guys. I'll leave the link in the description below. Okay, I think overall I love the shot. Let's just enhance it a little bit with alien skin exposure again. Th this is my go-to. A lot of people ask me like, hey Frank, what do you use for tinting? And do you also use something else than alien skin exposure? Uh, I have to be honest, I used a lot of DxO Film Pack, which I still love, but somehow Alien Skin Exposure is so much improving. Every, every time they bring out a new version, you go like, it can't get better than this. 
And then they bring out a new version and you go like, okay, can't be bit it. And it just keeps on going. They're really on a, lo on a roll. Oh, I love this. Give it a little bit more attitude. Now, I like to have the shadows a little bit more bluish, I think. Let me see. No, it makes it too dark. Okay, we we'll just go with this one. Gorgeous. And this is those moments when I love my job. New model and immediately getting some great shots. That's just great. And that's all the benefits of uh, all the credits go to the model, of course. I'm just pressing the shutter. She does all the work. Okay, close. Okay, cool. Let's do the, uh, the photo critiques for you guys. Let me just throw those in. Um, who sends in the photos? I don't know. I always delete who sends them in. Because I don't want to know. Because then sometimes I can be a little bit prejudgment. Okay, let me first show you something like a lot of people ask me like, Frank, what is the video I should get if I get one of your instructional videos? This is the one, without any doubt. In this tutorial, we're actually gonna show you that you can make great images with very, very simple tools. What to think about a tungsten light bulb? The LED panel. Flashlight, the Fresnel, the Westcott Ice Light, smartphones, Loom Cube, the Chandelier, Christmas lights, we call them light snakes over here. This is one of the most creative lighting videos I ever created. I'm very enthusiastic about it. It's available now via our website. See the links. And you can get all these amazing videos and much more on... There we go. And get them. You really support our work. Okay, so first image. Uh, love it. The only thing is it's a little bit blown out and in all honesty I don't like that you don't see any detail here. So in my personal opinion, I would like to tone it down just a little bit. Also composition wise, I don't like borders. Now this is something personal. So personally, I wouldn't take the borders. And you remember my talk about negative and positive space? Watch this. So we're just gonna do this. We're gonna close in on the model, like really close in. I'm gonna make it like this. Let me just change this for white. There we go. Okay, now look at the difference. Of course, we have to take this out. Now for me, the image looks way better. And now if I also do this, don't be afraid. Or maybe you want to see that little knot in her hair. There we go. So now for me, there's more balance in the shot. It's just more pleasing to look at. But that's personal again. So everything I show you guys here is personal. But in my opinion, you should do it like that. Or at least try it and see if you like it. The reason I don't like borders is because in 10 years you look at, or maybe in a year or five months or whatever, you look at the shot and you go like, yeah, I don't like those borders, but they're there. If you store as PSDs, yes, you can take the borders out. Okay, so that's one. Okay, this one. I really like the shot. There's nothing wrong with it lighting-wise. The thing is, I would like to see a little bit more expression. Just a little bit. It's a little bit like, I, I think she loves the shot and she will adore you for taking it. But as a photographer, I would like to see a little bit more power in her expression. Like you saw me coaching Natalia, constantly keeping that flow going and making sure that she understands like, hey, we have to do something. Okay, so color-wise, there's a trick that I love to do. Layer, new layer, and then go for soft light. Uh, no, just keep it normal, sorry. That's another trick. This is an empty layer. Go to your background and go to channels. Now go to the red channel. Control A, select everything. Control C, copy. On a Mac command, I believe. Go to that, back, uh, that top layer and Control V, just drop it in. So now I have my red channel copied over the original image. Now what I can do 
is by using soft light or hard light. A soft light is better sometimes. So this is without. And just slowly build the effect up. There we go. Now this already gives your image a little bit more of a fashiony look. See the difference? This is a little bit flat. Here you get a little bit more. It's not contrast. You get contrast, but it's also like the skin tones get just a little bit more toned down. Now because he's a red hat, I would actually do this. Layer mask, reveal all, take a brush with black paint and just make sure that the reds in her hair get back. And maybe even her face because it's a little bit reddish. There we go. Okay, now if you want more red in her hair, now of course you can do it with, um, let, let me show you different techniques for this. So go for, um, sorry, the sponge tool and go for saturate. This is the easiest way. Just go for saturate. But as you can see, because he doesn't have red hair everywhere, or not completely, you don't make it nice and you don't make it fit. So there's another way that's way easier. Just go for a brush, change the brush into color mode, and now... Uh, color, sorry. Now just sample a color. Uh, let me go this one. don't like that red. Now the cool thing is I can change the red of a color, of her um, hair. So let's say I want it really red like this. Love it. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't disconnect my channel yet because I'm not done. Now it's not going to be yoker. Okay, so this looks really cool. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to start at zero and just slowly build it up. There we go. So now she has a more natural looking red. So always overdo it and then just pull it back. Do you see the difference? It's very, very subtle. You hardly see it because it came from this. But you just blend it in until you see what you like. There you go. And now she's got a really nice red U. Okay. Now if you want to go one step further and now you have to determine <coughs> if this is a portrait, stop. This is it. If you are a little bit more free and it's like a model shoot, do this. So go into... Uh, let me just do it like this. Layer, do a new adjustment layer. Just go into curves. And now just go into your reds. And just take away a little bit of the reds from the shadows and just put it into the highlights. There you go. It's very, very subtle. But you get a little bit of that almost cross-processed look, but very subtle. Okay, so I like this. Okay, layer flatten image. I always do flatten image, sorry. So if somebody asked me about dots and burn. Yes, you can. So let's just go to dots. And this is where I use dots and burn a lot. I will just go over the highlights. And let's just bump it up a lot. That's the cool thing. You can just go over the shadows too because it only enhances the highlights. So it leaves the shadows alone. Okay, I'm overdoing it now so you can see the difference in a moment. And then I will tone the effect down. Okay. So before and after. Okay. And do the same thing for the blacks. So burn. And with the blacks, I do it a little bit more careful. I hardly do anything with the blacks, I have to be honest. Just barely touching it. Okay, there we go. Before and after. And now just tone it down to zero and just build it up until you see what you like. There you go. Awesome. Now again, all the retouching I do is 100% personal, and that's why, because it's 100% personal, I personally would do this. Which gives it even more, by the way, I think. I don't know for sure. Let me see. Eh, 
it's also good as it was, I think. Let me see, let me go back. Yeah, you can do both. But I'm more like a cropper. I think this. Yeah. But but both are right. Now I know when you shoot for a model, they, they always want that top part to show. When I shoot for a for my own, I always like to cut it off just a little bit. Except when it's motion and I cut off something from the bottom, I will cut it off. When it's not, I will leave it in. So it, it's personal. It's something that, you know, you can do whatever you want. It's your image. Okay. File close. Uh, save now. Okay, uh, let me switch back to full camera. And then we have some really cool stuff for you guys. <coughs> now, on September 1st, I believe September 1st, right? We're in New York. We're in New York for a full day workshop. It's a crazy studio. It's Studio FD. Hey, what's in the name? And they have these, um, we have to find it out. It's called French Walls. It's absolutely stunning. We will add some images on our website for the registration. Just go to frankdorov.com and just press on the little button for New York. We have an early bird up until the end of May. So make sure you register before. I always do small group workshops, so they will sell out pretty fast when they start promoting it over there. So the first up until May, we only promote it and we let a little bit of the American friends of us promote it. But after May, the price will go up $100 and then they also start promoting it over there. So make sure you are in that early bird up until end of May. So make sure you don't miss that one. It's going to be awesome. We have a really cool model. It's going to be for the first time that we're also going to combine a little bit of glamour in a workshop abroad. So very, very exciting because those studio that, that studio is just... It's awesome. We can, we can use smoke, we can use backlighting, we can use available lighting there. It's, it's just a crazy studio. It's like your dream studio. Okay, there are no more questions. I have a few more things that are important. So on May 29th, we have a new digital classroom, and that one will be alternative lighting. You asked for it, you're going to get it. Lighting with LED panels. Continuous lighting. We're going to use Hansel LEDs and we're going to use a let go LEDs and we're going to use a LED strip. We're going to use smoke, we're going to use whatever you guys want. It's going to be awesome. Uh, on June 22, for the Dutch people, we have a workshop at a railroad museum. It's almost filled up. So we have one or two seats left, I believe. And the last time it was an amazing experience. We never do workshops on a location twice or we try not to do. But this one we're going to do again. It's like you saw the one with all the planes? This is one with all the trains. Hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> it just came up with that one. But it's absolutely awesome. June 29th, we are in Delft for a workshop, the Hensel Tour. So make sure you register for that if you are in the neighborhood. And of course, September 1st, New York. Check out Kelby 1 for the two new classes. They are absolutely awesome. And of course, check out the new College Checker Passport 2. Now, the stuff we used today, of course, monitors BenQ and, of course, the Strobes Photics and, yes, the Rogue Expo Imaging. I can't stress enough how much I love those flash benders. It's, you know, I always tried a lot of different kit when I started using speed lights and I never really stuck with something. I always wanted something new, something better, something different. You know how we are, right? We love gas, gear acquisition syndrome. And as soon as I found the flash benders, it all stopped. It's like my guitars. I love collecting guitars. I bought a gem from 1992. That's an Ibanez gem. And I lost all my fun in collecting guitars because that one is just for me. The moment I picked it up, I played. It's an amazing guitar with a lot of different sounds. It's, but I don't want to talk too much about guitars, but let me put it this way. It's the same with the flash benders. You're always looking for something that you can't do. You get a flash bender, you go like, yep, this is it. All the fun is gone. Now let's have some fun with this gear. So all the fun is gone in collecting other stuff. You don't have to try anything anymore. It just fits you like a glove. Of course, it varies per person. If you like big softboxes, yeah, this, this is not the modifier for you. If you like like me, if you like like me, hmm. if you are like me and you like that high contrast look and total control over your images, Rogue Expo Imaging, I can't recommend them more than I already did. It's awesome. Thank you so very much. And see you again next time for another Digital Classroom. If you have any questions, leave them below. We'll check our channel constantly. And did I forget something? I have the feeling I forget something. Oh, yes. Very important. 
If you like our work, I have one final video for you guys. And this one is really important for us. Hey guys, and welcome to our studio in Amelot. My name is Frank Doroff, and today I want to talk to you guys about something that we get a lot of questions about. Hey Frank, how do you like this image? Hey Frank, what can I improve in this image? And of course, I love to help you guys out. But online, I mostly am limited to just saying, hey, I really like it, or continue like this, or change this. I, I can only do short images because, let's be honest, we get so many questions. So that's what actually got us thinking. And we started a Patreon. Now, what is a Patreon? Well, let me put it this way. Do you want an extensive photo critique every month? Do you want the bed phone where well, you can directly contact me with any questions you have? Do you want to be a member of a group that's closed off on Facebook that have the same interest as you guys? That isn't about putting people down, but it's actually about helping people progress in their photography and retouching. Well, that's our Patreon. Now, by joining our Patreon, every month you can deliver one or two images. We're not that strict about it. And I will do a whole video. In that video, I will show you how I would do the retouching, what I would change about the shot, and I give you a whole lot of tips. That video is put online on a closed-off website, and it means that only the guys from Patreon can see that video and help you out. So I help you out, and the whole community helps you out. It's just an awesome way to learn. So, if you like what we do, of course, the first thing you can do is subscribe to our channels, leave comments, and smash that like button because we really like it and tell other people about it. But if you want to do a little bit more and help us out creating the awesome programs you enjoy, like Behind the Closed Doors, Digital Classroom, quite frankly, our upcoming podcast, Beyond Photography with the Doorhoffs, and a lot more, then please join our Patreon. I already know you're absolutely gonna love it. So head on over to the link below and start joining our awesome group on Patreon and get a lot of benefits. Thank you so very much for supporting our work. See you online. Okay, Patreon starts at one buck a month and you really support our work. And it's awesome because online, I say awesome way too much, but it's so awesome, that word, awesome. So anyway, so for one buck a month, you get access to our closed up Facebook group. It's really nice and you get a lot of videos. Like recently I uploaded a video which was only available on Patreon. And we do a lot of photos there. And of course, behind the scenes images and whatnot more. Now, because we were actually both Anna Week and I sick for almost, well, three weeks, we didn't do a lot on Patreon, but we are picking that up again. So portfolio reviews are running up again. And of course, the behind the scenes, we start this weekend again with workshops. So if you join our Patreon, you get a lot of information behind the scenes and shots and whatnot more. Thank you so very much for watching, guys. Thanks to BenQ and Rogue for making this possible. I believe it's already the fourth season, so they rock. See you again next time, and send in your images for critique. You can just send them to a community at frankdorf.com or just send them to info at frankdorf.com. It doesn't matter. Okay, see you again next time. Gonna close down. Bye-bye.